Good evening and welcome everyone to the 200th National Writers Series Author Event and what a special conversation we'll have tonight. My name is Lisa Thauvet and I'm a proud board member of the National Writers Series. My background is as a Montessori educator and administrator with my side gig as a comedic improviser. That's why it is extra exciting for me to introduce to the National Writers Series virtual stage two great minds of comedy author Michael Schur, and guest host Ed Helms. But first, I'd like to thank our sponsors who allow us to bring such great authors and hosts to our shores of Lake Michigan. We're so grateful for the sustaining sponsorship of Cordia. Also, today's Golden Fowler Home Furnishings provides our winter spring season sponsorship with Boomerang Catapult as event sponsor and Image 360 as our literacy sponsor. We have three great supporting sponsors, which are Amacaw, Morsels, and Cherry Capital Airport. Our arts benefactor sponsor is Northwest Michigan Arts and Culture Network, and our major media sponsor is Record Eagle. Supporting media sponsors are Interlock and Public Radio, Midwest Broadcasting, Northern Express, and Traverse Area Community Media. We are also grateful for our supporting partners who are Horizons Books, Northwestern Michigan College, and Traverse Area District Library. This city is truly a book town. And finally, our grantors are the National Endowment for the Arts and the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs. Now on to our guest host and author, who of course have links to Michigan because all great things originate from the Great Lakes. To start, our guest host is Ed Helms. Ed Helms is an actor, writer, producer, and comedian who had a start on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart and a little show you may have heard of, The Office. He also starred in The Hangover Trilogy and has since launched his own production company with producer Mike Falbo called Pacific Electric Picture Company. Outside of entertainment, Helms is on the board for Represent Us and sits on the Oberlin College Board of Trustees. A lifelong musician, he plays a mean banjo in his bluegrass band, The Lonesome Trio. Which brings us to Ed's connection to Michigan. Where do multi-talented artists spend their summers as a kid? Why, of course, at our very own Interlochen Arts Academy where Ed attended in his youth. Welcome back virtually to Northern Michigan, Ed. Our guest author is Michael Schur. Michael Schur is a television writer and producer who has worked on shows like The Office, Master of None, The Comeback, and Hacks, and created or co-created Parks and Recreation, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, The Good Place, and Rutherford Falls. He lives in Los Angeles with his wife, Jennifer, and their two kids, William and Ivy. Not usually part of his bio, but it is tonight, Michael was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Like I said, all great things originate in Michigan. Michael Schur's book, How to Be Perfect, reflects on moral philosophy, with jokes, of course, providing a foundation for all of us to consider our behavior and ponder how we can do better and be better to one another something we all need more than ever. So, sit back, grab a notebook, digital or otherwise, to capture the wisdom about to spew forth and enjoy a great National Writer Series conversation with Ed Helms and Michael Schur. Well, hello. <laughs> I'm Ed Helms. Is Mike, uh, are you there? I'm here. Can you can see me? Hey. Can you? I hope you can. Right. There you Fantastic. are. Fantastic. Um, well, very cool. This is really exciting. I'm very, uh, very uh, glad to be hosting this. Um, How did you feel with... about the concept of wisdom spewing forth? How did that hit your ear? I was, I'm a little bit, uh, it feels like a high bar. It meet. does, doesn't and, it? Uh, <laughs> it feels like they're looking for a geyser of wisdom, like a just an yeah. eruption of of wisdom everywhere. I don't know if we can rise to that standard. I'm not sure I even want to do that, because <laughs> uh, it 
it could be a scary, uh, scary it's, image, but it sounds um, scary. Yeah. But I, I think, uh, I generally think of you, Mike, as as a sort of fountain of wisdom. So maybe okay. we can that's a maybe we can go with that. Like a gentle, uh, a gentle fountain, like a not a, not a like an ex, like a fire hose. No, no, no. Like a little frog on a pedestal <laughs> with the, you know, um, that's what you are. OK, thank you. Wisdom, I, I'll, I'll happily take that. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> this will be the whole chat, by the way. <laughs> um, uh I do feel some some sort of uh, obligation to steer this conversation. So, Mike, I'm going to take charge in this do moment. Do it, do it, man. Um, and uh, and tell you, I actually haven't had a chance to talk to you since I read your book in its entirety, mm. and um, it's it's not good. I <laughs> don't. <laughs> it's I. I I couldn't resist the joke, but it truly, I loved it, Mike. And, and I'm not, Thank you. Uh, I, I'm not just sort of like blowing sunshine. I, I really, really loved it. it it's, it's, uh, if you're a fan of Mike's television, I think you're really going to love the book because it's so Mike, it's so you, I've known you for so many years and there's something, it just feels like, uh it feels like you just sitting across from me chatting and it's it's so so funny and delightful that way that might have also uh been uh part of that might might have been that i listened to a lot of it on the audiobook sure um which is your actual voice yes and, i did the uh, own i did my own reading for the audiobook uh which was very scary have you ever done that have you ever like narrated something long form like that mm, i don't think so no it's um it's very scary process and uh it does two things it makes you hate the thing that you're <laughs> that you're reading <laughs> because you just you you're not when you're writing something you don't say it out loud and then when once you say it out loud you can't help but focus on all of the sentences that you wrote that you think are clumsy or could have been better but also you start to go a little crazy i think you start to be like is what i'm saying even making sense like is this does can anyone follow this? Like, I, I don't yeah. know, like you, it's very, you dissociate from your body and are, and are, it's very confusing. I know a couple of people now who have said they listened to the audiobook and enjoyed it. So I'm taking that as a good sign that I didn't just babble incoherently <laughs> into a microphone. No, it's, uh, it's, it's great. <laughs> and, uh, and, and spoiler alert, there is a Getty Lee cameo lead singer That's of right. Rush. I'm not going to say what it is. Maybe the most exciting thing about it, I roped the cast of The Good Place into it. They do a bunch of different voices. They read a bunch of quotes from famous philosophers. And Ted Danson reads the table of contents in each chapter heading, which is just a like a wonderful thing. But yeah, I, there is a moment at which uh, Getty Lee, the lead singer of Rush, appears and reads his own music lyrics. Uh, although actually I think Neil Peart technically wrote the lyrics to that song, but it doesn't matter. Getty Lee does an audio cameo on the audiobook. That's all you need to know. What else do you need to know before you buy it that, other than that Getty Lee appears? And that you should just skip ahead to that part because that's it's right. the best. Yeah. Um, well, so for our audience's sake, Mike, uh, tell us what the, the title of the book is How to Be Perfect. Um, Tell us what it is just in the most general terms and where and where the idea came from. So it's basically all of this stuff that I read and that uh, that we read as a, a collective um, entertainment unit when we were writing The Good Place. Uh, all the philosophy, all of the theories, all that stuff. When we got to the end of the show, I had this real um, kind of deep feeling that I wasn't quite done uh, talking about it somehow that like I that I wanted to I wanted the the we infused a lot of it into the show but also that's performative art right it's like other but, people but, are but, but what is it the okay. philosophy the the the, 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 moral the, meat, the, the actual moral yeah. philosophy that we read yes sorry I should have clarified that so we put a lot of that philosophy into the show into the mouths of various talented actors, but I felt like I wasn't quite done yet. So I thought about this project as an exit interview that I was conducting on myself to say, what have I learned about all this stuff? And importantly, I felt like as a guy who didn't really know a lot about it before I started reading, I felt like 
it was very useful to me in my everyday life because I had taken it with the help of the other writers and with people like Todd May, who is a professor of philosophy who helped me uh, advise us on the show and helped me with the book, and Pamela Hieronymi, who is another professor who was an advisor. I had taken it from these kind of big, giant, difficult, thorny, abstract concepts, and we had wrangled it and wrestled it to the ground, and I could understand it. And, and I felt like that was useful to me. And so I thought like if I could conduct this exit interview on myself and put it all into this book and talk about it, like you say, conversationally and humorously and casually, that there are people who might not otherwise be interested in trying to clear that high barrier of entry of, of wrangling with moral philosophy might be able to read it and enjoy it and get some use out of it too. So that was the, that was the, I was trying to be a filter because of all the stuff I had read and all the people who had helped me understand it. I was like, oh, now I can sort of present it this way and hopefully someone else might read it and think it's interesting. Um, very cool. So I wonder if we can back up a little bit even from there. Um, can you identify why and where this interest of yours came from? I mean, a, a lot of people really don't care about moral philosophy. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and a lot of people do. And how is it that you got hooked on this? Where did this passion and interest come from? It's a good question. Um, I, I don't a hundred percent know, although I have some clues, I would say, um, one of them is that when I was a kid, I was extremely interested in rules. Uh, I remember I have a very early memory of being in kindergarten and having the teacher say, okay, everybody line up. And I immediately got into line. And then I remember looking around at the other kids who were still goofing off and thinking like, what are they doing? The teacher said, get in line. Like, what, how do they not hear her? Like, this is insane. The, we, there's a rule and we have to follow it. Like I, so I, I always had this like inclination to, to like understand what the rules were for what it, you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do. And then to follow those rules. Some people would say that's a kiss ass. So that I'm describing a kiss ass. I prefer to think of it as a dutiful child who, who had a very strong moral compass. Uh, but that, whatever that predilection was, then as I grew up, there were moments in my life, some of which I write about in the book, where I got embroiled, as we do from time to time, in some kind of weird ethical quandary. And when it was over, I not only was upset about the way that I felt from learning that I had done something wrong, but also had a strong urge to go figure out why what I had done was wrong. And the first of those events, which is a kind of a long story that is too long to go into, really involved my wife getting into this fender bender and getting into a dispute over the, uh, over the damage. And when that was over, and it's a wild story, I was like, or even while it was happening, I was like, I need to understand what I know I'm screwing up. I don't know why I can't put a vocabulary to it or a, or a structure around it. And so I just went in search of like reading ethics and moral philosophy and talking to people. I cold called a bunch of philosophy professors and explained the situation I was like, what am I doing wrong? Why is this bad? I know it's bad. I don't know why. So whatever that like inclination I had when I was a kid, clearly like, followed me. And then it led me to these various points in my life where I became a sort of detective and wanted to like, get in there and investigate uh, and try to figure out if I could put a name to what I was doing that felt wrong or bad. Yeah, just it, it's, it's really, I, I find it fascinating. There's a need for like over the centuries, humans have have had this need to write down and codify moral and ethical guidelines. I mean, it's yeah. like, the, it's the origin of religion. It's the, it's moral philosophy, obviously, but uh, arguably the root of, of political science and sociology and all these things like, uh, but it, it, it does seem to be like certain people among them, you, uh, <laughs> I, I think it's interesting that like as a child, I, I was a rule follower too as a kid. I used to read The Cat in the Hat and just be so anxious 
<laughs> about when mom was going to come home. Like what the, 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 the fish is the voice of reason in that book. And like, you can't, you can't have this. This cat is an agent of chaos. Like, get yeah. out of the house. Yeah. Like, what are you so doing, man? For me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but I I guess um, I, I guess I wonder. Uh, do you think that your need to follow rules as a as a kid is, is also is part of what has fueled your desire to write them down in the form of first in the form of this show, but now in the, uh, the good place, but then now in the form of this book, in other words, you've entered the kind of like, you know, among the philosophers and the people that really think about this stuff by writing it down, you have sort of, you are now an expression of that human need to codify. Yeah. The, the dedication of the book is it's half dedicated to my wife and children. And it's half dedicated to everyone who has ever given a crap about this stuff, because I, there is something that I find very beautiful about the idea that for thousands and thousands of years across the entire globe, people in every different kind of society have been stewing on these questions. And that's how you know at some level that they're important. Like you can find you know, a lot of the stuff I talk about is stuff that came out of Western secular thought, right? Europe and and the Americas and and it's and, and Greece. But there's also enormous amounts of philosophy from Africa and from East Asia and from everywhere. And it dates back thousands and thousands of years. There's tons of shards of pre-Socratic Greek philosophy that are just little thoughts written down on scraps of like papyrus that were just discovered and they were like, oh, for thousands of years, people have been trying to get to the, get to the bottom of this stuff. That's why I think it, it's like the proof that it matters, I think, is that everyone mm -hmm. everywhere has always been thinking about it. Like it's very unlikely that it's meaningless if everyone everywhere in every nation for thousands of years has been talking about it. So I, I do, I, I think that that, my inclinations were my inclinations in terms of being a rule follower. But I think that as I've grown up and as I've become a person who exists on earth with like a lot of varied um, interests that I feel like, you know, when you, um, when you learn a new word that you've never learned before, and then suddenly within a week, you've seen it in like 11 books and magazine articles, and you've heard it and, and that and you're suddenly aware of it everywhere. I sort of felt like that with moral philosophy. Like once I started poking around and reading about it and kind of getting interested in it, suddenly every newspaper article, every story I heard, every, um, every New Yorker piece I read, whatever I experienced in the culture, I was like, well, this is an ethical question. This is a question to moral philosophy. And I had never thought about it that way before because I wasn't tuned in to like, my, my antenna weren't catching that frequency. But you know that that story in the New Yorker um, from a, a, a couple months ago that like set the internet on fire. The bad art friend, remember that story? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. That's one hundred percent an ethical moral philosophy thought experiment, right? It's like how did everybody behave? What are the ways that they were wrong? What are the ways that they were right? Is it wrong to donate a kidney and then brag about it? Like I literally write about those two issues in the book, completely right. coincidentally. Because, it, and it's, so I think ultimately that's what has spurred my interest in this more than anything is that once my antenna caught the frequency, I just felt like I saw it everywhere. I, I was like, oh, it's everywhere around me. It's not just in the political arena, which it obviously is all the time. It's not just in big questions of like, should we pass this law or not? You know, it's just, it's in everything. It's in every human interaction that you witness or read about mm -hmm. has some ethical component to it. I think that means it's important, you know? Yeah. I, 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 I'm eager to, to get into like where and how moral philosophy fits into day-to-day -day life. But I'm going to back up for a second because I do want, for the sake of the audience, to just talk a little bit more specifically about the book again. Sure. And there's there's <clears throat> something you that I really enjoyed, which was um, the 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 way you formatted the book. So if we if we look at the good place, the show, 
uh, each character on that show, the, the sort of main characters represent, they're sort of vessels for the different schools of philosophy. Mm -hmm. And then it's really fun to watch them collide like billiards and, and you kind of hear them, the ideas bounce off each other uh, in hilarious, wonderful ways. Um, the book is prose. You don't have that that sort of device or conceit to 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 work with. So how did you think about first tell us how you formatted the book and then why? So the book is each chapter is a question, um, usually a kind of silly question. Like the first chapter is should I punch my friend in the face for no reason? Let's yes. answer that question. <laughs> no, yes. no, no, so you've already blown it. Um, Damn it. But uh, then the second question is about the trolley problem. It's should I let this trolley kill five people or pull a lever and have it kill one person? There are questions like, should I lie and tell my friend I like her ugly shirt? So the, the, it's basically three, it's really three sections. The first section, which is the first four chapters, each question is intended to spur a discussion of one of the main schools of thought that we're going to talk about. So should I lie and tell my friend... I like her ugly shirt. That's about deontology. That's Immanuel Kant because he was a super strict dude who thought you could never lie to anyone forever for any reason ever. Even if a murderer shows up at your house and says, uh, I'm here to kill your brother. Is your brother home? And your brother's hiding upstairs. You're not allowed to say in Kant's view, no, sorry, I don't know where he is because that's lying and that's not allowed. So he was a very, very strict rules and regulations type guy. So that's why that chapter is phrased the way it is. So each also of those chapters, a party animal, took wild man, like uh, <laughs> Hawaiian shirts and sunglasses and playing the saxophone. Yeah, life of the party. Pool. <laughs> so I wonder if his friends were like, like the, they had a running joke of like, hey, uh, do, do you want to go have some fun? Uh, sorry, I Emmanuel can't do that. I mean, if they didn't have that because they all spoke German instead of English, then they should have. Right. <laughs> also, he probably had no friends is the other thing. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so the first four chapters are the are the four main schools of thought that kind of resonate throughout the book. Then the middle section is, okay, let's take those theories and apply them to some trickier questions like uh, that aren't as easy to explain as should I punch my friend in the face for no reason, like some slightly dicier situations that we've all found ourselves in. And then the final section of the book is like the thorniest questions I think I could think of, basically, like that section has questions like, can we essentially, can we separate the art from the artist? Like, what do you do when you love a musician or a director or an actor or a, an athlete who is a deeply problematic person, but that person's work like really changed who you are and really matters to you somewhere down deep. Like, how do you wrestle with that? Which I think is a thing we've all thought of. I mean, there must be so many people out there who are huge Ed Helms fans and have just been wondering for years, like, how do I deal with what a monster this guy is? This book will help you. <laughs> this book will help you navigate that tricky situation. So it's, and, and then along the way, after those first four schools of thought are sort of laid out, also other stuff keeps filtering in. New ideas kind of filter in, stuff that wasn't maybe as purely foundational to either the show or to the book as a whole, but which I find really interesting and, and thought were worth discussing. So Every chapter is a is a question, and then the questions kind of get tougher as you go along. Uh huh. And they're they're just they're basically um, a launch pad for each of these schools of thought. And the ones that you cover are uh, Aristotelian ethics, virtue Does ethics. Does that have yep. a different virtue ethics? Virtue ethics. Yeah. Deontology, mm -hmm. utilitarianism, contractualism, right? right. Ubuntu. Mm hmm existentialism right pragmatism which is pragmatism is william james's thing uh -huh. um there's also some some contract theory some john rawls contract theory in there um at the end um which i think is fascinating there's also uh, there's a it's not really a school of thought but there's a philosopher named robert frank a sociologist philosopher who talks about the role of luck in people's lives mm. and i his right. book was really really formative for me because it put a name to something I have felt about my own life for years and never could quite explain. And he basically says, and it's, I think it's a wonderful book. He basically says like the, we are very reluctant to ascribe 
any aspect of our success to luck because we're deeply invested in the idea that if we're successful, that we we're just awesome. We're brilliant and geniuses and we're so smart and we're better than everybody else. But his point is even the most, pick the most successful person you can imagine, Michael Jordan or Bill Gates or whoever, some portion of that person's life is due entirely to luck that had nothing to do with, with their intelligence or skill or talent or anything else. And it's okay to say that. And it doesn't take away from their accomplishments. It doesn't mean they're any less remarkable people. We just need to understand the role that luck plays in all of our lives. And that luck is stuff like in Bill Gates's case, he was born a white dude in America at exactly the time that led to him uh, joining a high school that had like in the in in Washington state that had like the first computer terminal, it was like right next door to his high school. And so he was like, Oh, cool, I'm gonna play with this computer and see what it's all about. And then he invents Microsoft like that. So that's not, you know, he if Bill Gates had been a surgeon or a lawyer or whatever, he also probably would have been an incredibly successful surgeon or lawyer, because he's a genius. But the fact that he went the way he did is partially due to this completely random series of events where he was born, who his parents were, what his race and gender was that meant he was immune from certain oppressive qualities of society. And then he took off. So I think that's a really interesting thing to think about. Like that if, if you, it's like, it seems crazy to say, oh, Michael Jordan was lucky. Because the whole Michael Jordan's whole thing is he worked harder than everybody else. He was more talented than everybody else. His drive and determination were greater than everybody else's drive. And as Robert Frank points out, also he was six foot six. So if you have exactly his in his profile and you put it into the body of a guy who's five seven, he doesn't become Michael Jordan. Like he plays high school basketball and then hits a wall and goes into, you know, runs a car dealership or something. Who knows? So there's a lot of, in addition to these big giant theories, there's all this other writing that I find really fascinating that I tried to sort of filter in as the book went along. Do you have a favorite of the, I mean, what I love about the book is that you, you lay all this stuff out there, but then it all gets kind of mashed through the Mike Schur Play-Doh extruder. And, and at the end is a little bit of like the, I guess we'll call surism mm. and uh uh and and i i find i found your sort of take to be a a a, a really nice amalgam of these different things but with a heavier much heavier dose of like compassion and and practicality uh that 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 a lot of like purely academic philosophy just does not have yeah um yeah but but that said uh was there is there one of these schools of the ones that you chose to cover in this book um do you have kind of like a favorite and why and why like i do um <clears throat> i would say that what i find wonderful about the whole field at least to the depths that i understand it is that there are moments and situations where it becomes clear that one or the other of the schools of thought is kind of the right approach to this problem, right? So utilitarianism, which gets a lot of criticism, a lot of people have a easy, it's easy to criticize utilitarianism. But basically what utilitarianism says is like, you know, maximize pain or sorry, <laughs> maximize happiness and pleasure and minimize pain and suffering. That's all it is. It's like, everyone's the same. We treat everybody the same. And the right thing to do is the thing that creates the most total happiness points and the fewest total pain points. And so that's not just how many people are experiencing pain or pleasure. It's how, how, how deep or lasting is that pain or pleasure? How, what's the duration of that pain or pleasure? All these sorts of different things, right? So you're talking about, let's say, doling out vaccines, right? Um, which are in limited supply when they, when they first come on the scene a year ago or more, very limited supply. Well, who do we give them to first? Well, we give them to the people who are at the greatest risk, right? We give them to the older people, people with comorbidities, people who are more susceptible to the disease 
than the average person is because each dose of the vaccine is thus maximized in terms of how much pleasure and happiness it gives people, right? Because the, if someone is 94% likely to die if they get COVID and you give that person a vaccine, then you've then there's an enormous amount of, of, of happiness that you've generated, potential happiness, right? As opposed to giving it to like a 21 year old on spring break in Daytona, who if he or she gets the, the disease is probably going to be fine. So that's a, there's a, it's an absolutely utilitarian calculation when you do something like a massive global vaccine effort. However, there are other situations in which utilitarianism like totally falls apart and is a terrible way to administer some kind of, um, some kind of project or whatever. The one that I find the most useful, the most often, I will say, is virtue ethics. Is Aris it's Aristotle's thing because he wasn't telling you what to do. He was telling you what kind of person you should be. So he his thing is basically there are these qualities that we love in people like compassion and generosity and humility and magnanimity and courage and whatever. And somewhere with each of those qualities there's like a dead solid perfect amount of that quality. And it seems weird to think of it as being in the middle instead of at the extreme. But his point was like, let's talk about courage. If you're way too courageous, if you are a soldier and you go into battle, you will storm over the hill by yourself and try to take on the entire opposing army alone and you'll be shot and killed. If you're completely non-courageous, as soon as the battle starts, you'll abandon your fellow soldiers, soldiers and you'll flee and run away and wet your pants. So somewhere in the middle is the right exact right amount of courage that you should have and the process of finding it and this is true for any quality is just trial and error it's just like you just do stuff over and over again you check in with yourself how was i courageous enough was i not courageous enough and it's this kind of lifelong process of just really keying in and paying attention to what you're doing in an attempt to get to the exact right middle amount of all these virtues the reason i love it is because it's so humane it's like mm -hmm. he's basically saying we're gonna screw up all the time like it's that's the deal like you the, the and in fact not only is it the deal it's necessary to get to the answers that we want because the only way you learn whether you're being too generous or not generous enough or too magnanimous or not magnanimous enough is if you screw up and then go ah i blew it there next time i'm going to modulate a little closer to that to that middle zone so in terms of like a guiding principle for your life, to me, that theory is the most like warm and, and embracing and generous and compassionate because it bakes into the equation a truth that we all know, which is that we suck at this and we're going to blow it all the time. And that's okay. And what matters is that you are paying attention and thinking about what you've done and modulating and trying to change your behavior going forward. That's a, that's a, there's a warmth there. There's a humanity there that you sometimes, or at least I don't feel in some of the other big theories. Yeah, no, I think you're, yeah, you're exactly right. There's, there's room for self-love in, in mm -hmm. that, in that school of thought. And for um, self-forgiveness. Yeah. That's, uh -huh. that's really the key. Um, okay. So uh, like, I'm curious about like you you've given a, a handful of examples of uh, various scenarios or thought experiments and how a couple of different schools of thought might guide us through those. What what? But really, I mean, <laughs> and like on a like walking through the world, like where the rubber meets the road, when we're mm -hmm. making these decisions on a daily basis or on an, on a, you know, minute by minute basis, um, you know, we're just confronted with, uh, with ethical decisions constantly all day mm -hmm. long. Is it, is it really practical? Um, is, is the, is the pursuit of understanding these things truly an effort to kind of help guide us through them or is it m more just a kind of like uh a, a way to help us understand them better almost in retrospect and i guess what i'm really asking is isn't so much of 
morality and ethics isn't isn't so much of that just intuitive and uh and that 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 the academic deconstruction of it doesn't have uh as much of a practical use and i'm and i'm saying that i, I i'm just asking that sort of as a gadfly i'm not saying that i'm not saying like isn't your entire book isn't useless? your book pointless <laughs> <laughs> um no i'm sort of like devil's advocate because I, <clears throat> I i do think there's a fun i mean look there's tremendous value in the academic deconstruction of of ideas on, on the merit like that's that has plenty of merit on its own um because i think over time the more we think and talk about things, the more we internalize them. And that's uh, and that informs our behavior in ways that sometimes we don't even know. And that's good. Um, but like, is it practical to 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 read something like this and assume that that it's going to affect our decision making on a daily basis? OK, I would say a couple of things about this. The first thing I would say is that. Aristotle, again, believed that we have some of this in us from birth. He thought that basically from birth as little tiny children, we have uh, my term for it is like starter kits. Like we have a starter kit for generosity. And that's why you sometimes will see a two-year-old child with the cookies, like share her cookies with her friend, right? Like there's some deep, deep, deep instinct in us. That's probably part biological and part sociological, where we have the instinct to do good things for other people from birth. And Aristotle's point was, that's great. That's the indication that we have, that we have the, the ability of, to achieve virtue. He just thought that if you rely on that really simple, basic, almost animal instinct to be kind or generous or whatever, as an adult, you're just going to you're a, that's not good enough. Like that, that what's required is like, that's like a lump of clay and now we got to mold the clay. So to answer your first question, yeah, I think some of this is gut level instinctual. I think that as you, even if you never read a single thing about moral philosophy, you still have friends, you have a family, you interact with people at school or at work or wherever. And just by osmosis, you start to learn what the right behaviors are, right? It's rude to do certain things it's nice to do certain things whatever yeah so we yeah get, like we're, we're sort of like ai we just get feedback yeah, and we internalize that's right that's exactly we're right. artificial we're, intelligence also yes we should note obviously we're in a simulation so we're all we're all just <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah like of course some of this is instinctual and and that's a good thing because that means that we had it in us to begin with and now it's up to us to sort of figure out like how to what degree do we want to refine or or hone it. <clears throat> Excuse me. The other thing I would say though is that these philosophies are prescriptive. Like they are intending to tell you here's how you should act going forward. Here's how you should change how you behave. Now, you know, to one degree or another, they are useful in a practical sense. Like some of them are very impractical. Kant, I think, is a pretty impractical guy. <clears throat> the character of Chidi on The Good Place was a strict Kantian. And he was so, Kant is all about rules, 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 rules. There's a right thing to do and a wrong thing to do. You use your ability to pure, for pure reason, to tease out a maxim about right and wrong. You act out of a duty to follow that maxim. If you follow it, you've done the right thing. If you don't follow it, you've done the wrong thing. Very, very strict dude. And it's often not practical. That's just not a practical way to live. You don't have the time usually to sit and meditate for an hour about what the maxim is that 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 you should discern for this situation. So to, to greater or lesser degrees, these theories are actually applicable in your real life. There's a whole other factor going on though, which is, and, and I write about this at great extent in the book, if you even have the time to think about whether or not these theories what they say, whether or not they're practical, mull over which of them might be the most useful for you in a given situation. You are in an extreme position of privilege in the world because you have time and money and comfort and safety, and you're not fleeing from a paramilitary gang who's trying to kill you and your family, nor are you desperately searching for 
food or water or shelter or heat or anything. So our ability to actually engage with this stuff, read about it, use it, apply it to our real lives, there's an enormous scale here in terms of who has the time, energy, and resources to even engage with this stuff. And I think it's important because really no philosophers that I know of write explicitly about this fact. Our, there's, there's very little context provided. When these philosophers are giving their theories, they don't say, okay, if you're this kind of person, here's what's expected of you. And if you're this kind of person, here's what's expected of you. We need to do that for ourselves. We need to say in moments where we're in an ethical dilemma, if I'm even, if I even have the ability to mull this over, it means I'm in the upper echelon of lucky people in the world. Luck comes back in here, right? And, and if you acknowledge that, what becomes clear immediately is that your responsibilities scale up, in my opinion, because you can afford to do more thinking about this stuff and you can afford to spend a little extra time or money or whatever it is. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody else uh, who isn't as lucky as you gets to do whatever they want. Like there are certain minimums here. There are certain standards that I think everyone has to follow. Um, that's what contractualism is. I won't go into it, but it's sort of setting like minimum standards of how we treat other people that everybody has to follow no matter what. But I also think that as you go up the societal food chain, that the requirements, the demands of you should scale up as well, because you're luckier. And so you can afford to spend more of your time and energy on this stuff. And you should. Um, and I will just tell everyone that everything Mike's saying right now is expounded on very, in, in, in really thoughtful terms. Um, in the book. And I, I, I think it's, I think what you're saying is very profound and, uh, and it's, it, it is, a, it's a special part of the book, I think, where, you, where there's a, a real thoughtful context kind of template placed onto this stuff. Um, Cause it gets pretty heady and abstract and, um, and it's really nice. It, it feels a little bit like you're kind of lassoing it and just bringing it down to a, <laughs> And an accessible and and kind of like holding some of these ideas to account and just being like, well, okay, what's like really like? How does it really? How's this really going to work? Um, yeah, yeah, that that's is where a, I think. Yeah. You no, know, that's a question you ask a lot, or at least I found myself asking a lot, which was like, cool theory, impossible. Like, like right. there's and and you know, look, he Kant as one example was writing what he wrote 250 years ago. The world is a very different place 250 years ago. I think it might have been easier in 1789 to encounter a small problem in your life, enter a solitary meditation zone, discern a, a pure right. maxim using only your own brain, and then act on it um, than it is today because the world is coming at us extremely quickly, and there is not a lot of air or breath that you can take to mull this stuff over even in the best of circumstances so i do want to let them off the hook a little bit but like you know very frequently when you're reading one of these theories you're like that's really cool and it'll never work <laughs> yeah i i really like the the existential stuff where it's just kind of like we can't know this <laughs> we can't really understand this. No, I, a lot, just have a lot fun of people with it. think that's really that 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 that, that that has that that's kind of inherently bleak but and i had a friend actually uh who who i who said to me he I, I this guy was like someone i think of as like a seeker you know like always kind of getting into different belief systems and mm -hmm. trying out things and and he, he would bring ideas to me sometimes and i i i don't know if i don't think i'm cynical but i'm just a little bit like i just have a I can kind of roll with chaos, I guess, in, in a way, because because he he was saying to me like, "Don't you?" He, he was presenting something to me, and I was like, "Yeah, I don't I don't see it that way." And, and he's like, "Well, don't you need an answer? Like, don't you need an explanation for why we're here and why would?" And and I really identified with Camus and and uh, Sartre just kind of being like, 
I mean, we really can't know. Like, these <laughs> yeah. are just things that we, yeah, we can't, I, we, I, and we have to be okay with that. I'm with you. Like, I, I find, I find existentialism kind of joyful, and that mm-hmm. that is the point. Like the the book, or the 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 speech that I write about that Sartre gave was called "Existentialism is a Humanism," and it was a speech where he was attempting to say, like, why does everybody think I'm so bleak? Like, this is a good thing. Existentialism is a good thing. It's it's liberating. It's like there's no God and nothing. You 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 decide what you are through your actions. All we have is our actions. Like, there's no God. We, we were born. We do a bunch of stuff and we die. And so you you whatever you do is is what you are, is who you are. And he found that incredibly freeing and liberating because he was like, you can choose to do anything you want. Like if you want, like nothing, you're not being judged by anybody except essentially yourself and occasionally the people around you. But that means that there's nothing written in the stars. There's no, there's no script you're following. You get to write your own script. He found that very freeing and liberating. And I kind of agree with him. You know, I, I think. Well, do we know anything about Sartre's like persona? Was he a, a sort of I, bleak I vibe? Think was, I think he was very funny. I, that is my sense, yeah. and I, I haven't read enough of him to know for sure. I, but I, he had a he at one point he had a cat, and he named his cat nothing. Like it, it, he, it's not that he didn't give the cat a name. He gave it a name, and the name was nothing. That's hilarious. That's a really funny joke. I mean, it's it's all. Um, my childhood friend named his cat chicken salad sandwich. And I think that's a little bit funnier, but also nothing's funny. good. If you're an existentialist, <laughs> it's that's it's nothing funnier, but I do think you to, to sell that, those ideas, you, you gotta have uh, an abundance of charisma. Like yeah. you, if you're, if you're anything mm-hmm. less than, than like charming as hell, you're yeah. going to come off as, it's a real just the tough worst. Like such a with. drip. Well, you should see. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I put a pic. There's not very many pictures in the book, but one of them is Albert Camus. And the reason I put the picture in the book is because he's so hot. He's like the hottest dude I've ever seen. He's like wearing like a a pea coat, and he's like rakishly turned to the side, and he's got a cigarette dangling on the side of his mouth. And I'm like, oh my God, that dude is a stone cold hottie. Like, give it up I mean, for Camus. Yeah. Camus, Albert Camus. Um. All right, so uh, this is really fun, and I could talk to you for hours, but I do. We need to get to some questions. Let's do so, it. So uh, I want to get into the Q and A, um, but before I do, I do have one last question for you. Hit me. Uh, the trolley experiment, or the sorry, the trolley problem, is this wonderful thought experiment that that uh, is such a perfect way to dissect all these different ideas and approaches and um and and you do that very elegantly in the book there's a lot of discussion of the trolley problem and and all of its various permutations um but i don't think that you actually answer it mike sure <laughs> i don't think you actually weigh in on the trolley problem which is kind of a cop out i'm mm. just going to i'm just going to say it and so I need you to go on record right now in the trolley problem in its most basic iteration. What is Mike Schur's answer? Well, first of all, cop out is like the number one move on the part of philosophy professors everywhere. Like there's constant cop outs. There's they're always saying like, and why is this the right thing to do? You might ask, well, I'll leave that to the reader to decide <laughs> or like, I'll leave that as an exercise for the students. And like, it's a total cop out. And I do it like to like four times in the book, just to rub it in their faces that they do it all the time. But in its most basic, it is most basic form. The trolley problem is you're on a trolley, the brakes fail. There's five construction workers on the track. You can pull the lever, switch onto a different track and kill one other person. And most almost everyone says yes i pull the lever and the reason they give is that well five people dying is worse than one person dying and so i will save four human lives and i believe where i land on this is i also believe it is the correct move to pull the pull the lever but not simply because five is more than one that i don't think is the reason it's the right thing to do because if you if you follow that line of thought, you get into some weird places where you're like, well, what if 
would you kill one innocent person to save a hundred lives? Well, a hundred is more than one. So yeah, let's kill that innocent person. That's no good, right? Like you, you have there, there's a, the trolley problem is sneaky because it takes your own sense of who you are, your own sense of integrity out of the equation momentarily. It's like a sleight of hand trick where you don't realize that that's happened. You're just put in a situation, both outcomes are terrible and you're asked what you would do. And because of that, you don't think to yourself, I need to factor in my view of the world, my integrity, my own outlook on humanity into this equation. You just, you're tempted, you're distracted by the numbers. So you say, well, five is more than one. I, I don't want five people to die. It's better than one person dies. So you pull the lever. I think that the reason it's the right thing to do to pull the lever is a combination of all of the schools of thought of philosophy. A little bit, maybe the utilitarian thing of like, well, we don't know these people. They're all the same. So yeah, five is worse than one. A little bit of Kant saying that you are, you if you imagine a maxim and the maxim is, we should try to spare the lives of innocent people whenever possible, which it seems like a good universal maxim. You could imagine everybody in the world following that maxim, right? So, okay, yes, then you pull the lever. It's a little bit of contractualism, which is to say, if we're sitting around, contractualism is like everyone sits around a table and pitches rules and whatever rules we all agree to, those are the rules that we follow. So you could imagine, and anyone is allowed to, uh, to reject any rule. So if you were pitching a rule, in a contractualist meeting session that said, hey, um, if any of us is ever in a dire situation where uh, some number of people are going to die and we don't know anything about the people, we have no personal relationships to them, they're just random people, why don't we all agree that we'll try to save as many of them as possible? I think most people would agree to that rule, right? So like when you, when you filter, when you filter the, the decision to pull the lever through all of these schools of thought, you end up in the same place every time. You end up as like, I think it's the right move to just pull the lever. If you only rely on one of those schools of thought, then it's very easy for someone to come along and say, aha, but how about this similar situation, which will lead you to a troubling place? And then that's where you get screwed up. So I believe it is the right move to pull the lever. I just think that the, the reason it's the right move is very complicated. And needs you need to be drawing on a number of different things, including your own sense of right and wrong, your own sense of integrity about what you think is right, in order to get to that answer. So, or that's my answer. is it extremely simple, and everything else is just reverse engineering to get there? Well, that's what your forthcoming book will <laughs> deal with. <laughs> But moral philosophy, an exercise in reverse engineering. Um, <laughs> no, that's a, that's a legit answer. You answered it. And uh, so you're off the hook. Well Thank done. You, All right, let's get to some questions. Uh, this, uh, there's, some, there's a lot of great questions in here uh, that I'm seeing. And uh, uh, what are you, and, and by the way, if you don't mind, Mike, I'm just I'm going to request that maybe keep the answers concise. Some of these are pretty open ended, but answer quick, quickly, just so we can get to as many as we can. You what are you reading right now? What are you watching? I am reading a hell of a book by Jason Mott, which was recommended to me by like 50 people. I also just read I reread A Visit from the Goon Squad by Jennifer Egan because she has a sequel coming out that I'm very excited about. And I'm watching, um, I just watched Cheer season two with my wife. And uh, I don't think we've started a new show. What are you reading and watching? I'm also curious about what you're reading and watching right now, Ed Helms. Uh, I just read your book. Yeah. And I loved it. <laughs> um, and then uh, for the past couple of months, I've just been reading scripts for our show, Brother <laughs> Um, because we've been in production and we wrapped last night. Wrapped yesterday. Uh, yeah. Season two of Rutherford yeah, Falls coming, coming soon to Peacock. Last night. Season two coming soon. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, and I'm watching uh, a lot of the, the, the show Little Bear because mm. my four-year-old loves it. Great. And it's, uh, it is wonderful. Maurice Sendak does the illustrate the, the cartooning. It's great beautiful show um all right uh uh 
which school of philosophy do you think Dwight Schrute would subscribe to? Dwight is probably like a Nietzschean, right? Like Nietzsche, mm -hmm. who I don't write about very much, believed that there is a small number of people in the world who were incredible and perfect and excellent, and they should be allowed to do whatever they want. And everybody else who's less perfect and excellent and great should be forced to obey them. <laughs> and that seems like a pretty shrewd. He also has Germanic blood in him. So it's definitely one of the Germans. It's Kant or Nietzsche or maybe just Wagnerian opera is what he would follow right. as his philosophy, <laughs> something like that. Um, or, or, or German death metal. <laughs> what about Andy Bernard? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I feel I like he's he, the sort of contractual, like uh... contractualism is the most um, like social. You know, it's mm -hmm. the most like, like, hey, let's just all let's have a rap session. Right. Let's get some Chinese food and we'll just bang this out. Like he would definitely like the communal aspect of that. The only problem is he would agree to everybody's rules all the time just because right, right. he wanted everyone to like him. <laughs> uh, yeah, that is that's another place where a lot of these uh, a, a lot of philosophy or like economic theory, a lot of these things break down uh, it, on the assumption that humans act rationally, right? Yeah. I mean, that's where that's where the free market thing just crumbles. Like <laughs> human, we're just not rational. Mm -hmm. You can't, and we can't be relied upon to act rationally. Correct. Um, at least I'm not. Uh, okay. D -d 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 did you specifically work with the actors on The Good Place to help them understand all the ethical thinking in the show? Did you have an ethics boot camp? We did from time to time. Um, I would meet with Will, Harper, or Kristen, or Ted, or whoever, if there was something specifically kind of that we were really delving into that I, I felt like if in order to just understand what the hell you're talking about, you just need some basic backstory here. But they are also very smart people. And Kristen and Will, who had to handle the majority of the philosophy on the show, they would do their own reading, which was like wonderful. And they would get really into like whatever the subject was. So I didn't have to, we didn't need a boot camp. We had a sort of like, we would meet every once in a while casually. And I would just go like, here's, here's, here's what this philosophy says. Here's why we're doing this episode or whatever. One of my favorite times we did that was we did an episode where Ted Danson's character had an existential crisis and we got to have like a discussion of existentialism that Ted just really like locked into and found hilarious and wonderful. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, there were times when it, it was never a big, like sit down for an hour kind of a deal. It was like, Hey, give me 20 minutes so I can just run down this kind of basic theory here. And then they did their thing. So they didn't. They didn't need boot camp. They are. They were very good at picking up quickly what the ideas were and how to sort of make them make sense coming out of their mouths. Brilliant cast on that show. Yeah, like just so 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 funny. Um, Mike, you mentioned on a recent podcast that Greg Daniels taught you a PhD level class when working on The Office mm -hmm. when you were creating The Good Place. <laughs> Uh, what things were you sure to carry over and what did you leave behind? Mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, by the time we got to the good place, most of the people on that writing staff had worked with me before. Like there was a large number of parks and rec writers who came over to the, to that show. Um, so maybe a more appropriate question for parks and rec, which Greg and I ran together for the first season. Then I sort of, he sort of stepped back and I took over after that, but I mean, enormous, enormous swaths of Greg Daniels's show running are present in mine. And by the way, I would imagine Mindy Kaling's and BJ Novak's and Paul Lieberstein's and everybody else's because his, he was a, a not just a master of the form, but also a, an incredible instructor. And, you know, there were certain things, there are certainly certain things that he and I do differently. And I'm sure the same is true with Mindy and him and everybody and him. But in terms of like how to how to do the nuts and bolts work, how to break stories, how to how to execute the plan for a season, for a for an arc, for a character, all that stuff. I I mean I I quote him like he's a, like he's the Dalai Lama or something. Like I quote him, mm. I quote him and think of him as like an actual guru 
because his instruction was so thorough and his methodology was so good. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I've said this so many times, but I, he's the reason I have this job. <laughs> like I, there's no, if I had, I don't know what my career or life would be like if I hadn't gone to work for him for, for the first four years of my writing career. And same here for my acting career. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it really is amazing that the number, I, I'd be curious to sort of see how it stacks up with other showrunners at his level, but the number of, of writers from his staffs that hit, that have become showrunners is yeah. kind of staggering. Like it's, I mean, there are a few that, that a lot of people know, like you and Mindy and Paul Lieberstein, but there are a lot of others that are not household names. And it's, uh, it's kind of amazing. Yeah. It's like an NFL coaching tree. It's like, that's, it's some yeah. level how you know that a coach is truly great as if that coach's coordinators all then go on to get head coaching jobs and then have a success at those jobs. Like that, that his, his coaching tree is extremely long and, and full uh, and for good reason. All right. This question is from a serious Mike Scherer fan. Um, mm -hmm. And uh <laughs> It might need a little context for you. Um, to, you might need to give a little context before you answer outright, okay. but it's a great question. You're in a trolley careening towards an old woman. If you do nothing, she dies. But hot fruit disappears from the world forever. <laughs> what is the right moral decision? This is a question designed to illustrate my one of my greatest pet peeves, which is hot fruit. Um, I hate and hot what forms hate, in any form. There's no reason to heat up fruit. The, uh, fruit pie is disgusting. Cobbler is disgusting. If you want a piece of fruit, eat it cold. Like it was like, like nature made it, um, eat it at room temperature or eat it cold. Don't heat it up. It's a crime against humanity to heat fruit for any reason. And, um, I think I do it. I'm sorry, old lady. You, <laughs> you're gone. <laughs> No, of but, course not. Of but, course, human life, human life is more valuable than hot fruit. Although how what, old is she? Is she like, you yeah, know, is it right. like she's 102 kind of thing? Yeah. Uh, no, these are, these are important uh, <laughs> questions. Uh, what I love about your stance on hot fruit, and we've had a lot of fights about this because I am a giant fan of the Hawaiian pizza, uh, uh, which you go to great lengths to disparage throughout yeah the book by the yeah. way like there are multiple many, times yeah multiple references to how awful hawaiian pizza <laughs> is that are that that honestly uh throw into question the credibility of the entire book so um because hawaiian pizza is amazing and delicious it's one of the best things ever but what i find fascinating about your stance on hot fruit is that it's so intense that it's not that you're not content to just go through the world not partaking of hot fruit mm -hmm. you are on a crusade to rid the world of hot fruit and to make sure that nobody partakes in any form of hot fruit consumption yes, yes. i'm trying to open people's eyes to the injustice of it and to the cruelty of it and and <laughs> so i i've won some people over to my side by the way the worst thing about hawaiian pizza is that it makes the pineapple hot like what hot pineapple are you kidding me what is the oh, point so of good. hot pineapple it's the cold and juicy and wet. Like that's how you eat pineapple. It's cold and juicy Ugh. and wet. Gross. Ugh. You're so wrong about this, man. This is the single, I, there's literally one thing it's, on earth I don't like so about basic. you and it's this. It, 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 it's such a basic like yin and yang thing. You have the salty pizza and ham or, or, or pepperoni or what you have this. And, and then the pineapple is sweet. And it's like, it's a perfect combination eat a, eat a Car handful of cold corn. pineapple and some salted almonds and it'll be better this interview is over um all right let's see uh <laughs> this is a this is a long question that i haven't read so i'm just going to dive in and i don't right. know where it's going which right. moral philosophy best addresses a concern for the well-being of future generations and a future that they may not be a part of how do we engage our fellow citizens in developing a sense of stewardship for the future of humanity on a planet threatened by climate change? Well, that is an incredibly good question. Um, ironically, or maybe not ironically, 
we did an episode of Rutherford Falls in which Terry Thomas, played by Michael Gray Eyes, expresses something akin to a pan-native philosophy, which is the seven generations idea, right? And that is a, a philosophy that basically says you don't act for your current life or your current family or your current situation. You act in such a way that it benefits people seven generations down the line. That, if you just adopted that philosophy, I think you would do pretty well in terms of how you address the, something like climate change, because that is what's required. What's required is to take steps now that the results, the fruits of which won't even be born until 50 years from now or 100 years from now. All these big picture things that we're trying to accomplish, net zero by 2035 or no more coal burning plants by 2040, whatever, all those things, those are things that that even if we achieve them, we won't see their results on the massive momentum of global warming for 50, 100 years until we're gone. We'll, we'll be dead by the time that anyone can benefit from a net zero America in 2035 or 2040. So, I, I mean, I think all of this, any anything that addresses something as enormous and all-encompassing uh, all as climate change is going to require everything we got. Like, there's no one theory that you can follow. You would have to basically say, we are reorienting the concept of our, our, our primary objective in determining Kantian rules or Aristotelian virtue or whatever. The objective wouldn't be to make ourselves good people. The objective would have to be to cool the earth. And then you would have to follow rigidly whatever philosophy that is, because it's just too enormous a problem to be addressable by any one philosopher or any one theory. It requires everybody following all of them all of the time with the singular objective of acting in such a way so that it benefits the earth instead of your own wealth or happiness. And, uh, you know, that's why it se can seem so impossible sometimes. It's because, you, we, you, I mean, we can't get people to do anything in this country on masks. Like there's no, you can't get people to wear masks during a pandemic. It's awfully hard to imagine how you can get them to, um, you know, use less natural gas in their homes um, with the objective of helping the earth 150 years from now. So it can be despairing. It can be, you can fill you with despair and you can lose hope very easily. I mean, obviously, there's another whole issue here, which is that the individual behavior for something like climate change isn't nearly as important as nationwide government behavior or international cooperative behavior. Um, so that there's a whole other set of ethics that applies to things like governments and and um, laws and such. So it's going to take everybody doing everything that they can in order to solve the problem um, and I hope we figure it out because Earth is among my favorite planets to live on. I would say it's probably it's top four easily. I'm going to recycle this. Great job. That'll do it. <laughs> I think it's I mean, that might do it. That might be. it. Um, OK, I'm going to throw uh, this in the directly into the ocean. Um, hello, this I love this question. Um, Hello from Seattle. That part I'm neutral on. Um, <laughs> do you know of a test or measure that could be used to honestly, and I'm going to insert the word accurately, learn of a person's morals or ethics? If so, could we give it to politicians? It's kind of like, <laughs> is there a, is there, I mean, there, there are these fascinating uh, behavioral psychology tests and like, and there are, there are a lot of tests that are designed to kind of dupe the, uh, the test subject uh, as to the actual intent of the test. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some fascinating writing on all of this stuff. Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow, high recommend, amazing mm -hmm. book. Um, but uh, but do you think do you think there is something that, that there there might be a way uh, like other than just saying like hey how would you handle this situation how would you handle this situation do you think there is like a uh, 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 it would it be possible to design a test to actually divine the morals or ethics of somebody? 
I'll, I'm sure it's possible. I don't know of one. I'm sure there people have tried. I, I would guess um, it does feel like a more of a social psychology kind of problem or something than a than a philosophical problem um, or 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 a, I don't know, not problem, but a project. I guess. I mean, yeah, that it's an interesting idea. I, I'm not sure how you would do it and get good answers, right? Because I think that the difference between how someone might answer questions that are written down and actually behave on earth might be different. And I think that speaks to the ways in which we want to feel or seem or appear or represent ourselves as good people. But when push comes to shove, we often cut corners or kind of don't really mm -hmm, mm -hmm. do the things that we say we're going to do. So I'm not sure how accurate it would be, but it would be an interesting, like an ethical IQ test basically is what you're asking for. Um, and don't bother giving it to politicians because they'll just lie. They'll, they'll, no one would, no politicians. <laughs> they'll would all, not, yeah. they'll I mean, all pass with flying colors. Of course they would. I mean, you know, there, there's, there's a bill in Congress now that's aimed at stopping uh, members of Congress from trading individual stocks, right? This is, it's insane that that's allowed. It's insane that they're allowed to do that. They're the ones who make decisions with our money, our tax money, about how it gets spent, what companies it goes to, what private enterprises it gets doled out to. It is, and they have access to inside information about where that money is going to be spent. It is bananas that they're allowed to trade individual stocks. That bill is going to fail because they want to make money <laughs> trading on inside information about where their money is going. And it's like, there's no greater uh, exemplar of the, the way that, non-ethical behavior is baked into the concept of being a politician, then that that bill will almost certainly fail in Congress. So like, you just have to accept, and this is horrible to say, you just have to accept that politicians ethics are not going to rise to the standards that other people's ethics should rise to. It's impossible. Um, and it's just dispiriting again to know that, but, but all you have to do is look at, I mean, there were senators who learned information about COVID early on and how bad it was going to be and then bought a bunch of stock in like zoom and peloton and sold a bunch of stock and a bunch of other companies and made millions of dollars and they didn't even get in trouble for it like it got the news broke the receipts were there and they didn't even get in trouble i mean it's truly shocking what we let our politicians get away with in this country and um so i i think giving politicians an ethical iq test would be essentially pointless <laughs> um I can't help missing the opportunity to plug represent.us, which is an amazing anti-corruption organization I work with. Yeah. And I think uh, that's, uh, that's everything you're saying right now is, is top of their agenda. Um, here's, a, here's a fun one. I, I, I'm not aware of this. More than one of your shows have a line, shut up, Glenn. Who is Glenn and why do you hate him so much? <laughs> I wasn't, I'm not sure I was aware of that either. I mean, I know the good place did. I don't know what the other one was. Um, but uh, I think Glenn is a very funny name. I, I think I, I do this thing. I don't, do you do this thing? Do you do what I do when you're writing a script and you don't know what a character's name should be who enters a scene? Um, I, I have a bunch of stock names yeah, that I just put into the script, and you know, I'll fix this later. And those names are often Glenn, Doug, and Janet. Yeah, and like Janet well, on the Good Place is named Janet because I just never changed it. And Doug Forsett, um, who's right behind me here, Doug Forsett, he's named Doug because I just never went back and changed it. Like there are a lot of Janets and Dougs on all the shows I've ever worked on because I just I like don't know what to do. I just write Janet or Doug. Those it's funny that those names that you're mentioning because they sound like the names that somebody in like an office bullpen would shout off screen in an 80s comedy, right? Like, <laughs> Doug, get me the damn copies. Yeah. Get it. I need this. Like mm -hmm. the comedies that we grew up with. Yeah. Those names are like quintessential. Yeah. I don't think a lot of kids are being named Janet, Doug, and Glenn these days. No. <laughs> I think that's just, no. It's definitely betraying my age that I use Janet, Doug, and Glenn. <laughs> I had, it's, it, it is, the answer, by the way, on my part is yes. 
Um, and especially, uh, I think a lot of improv comedy people uh, when doing improv scenes, <laughs> I, I had, I had two names that I gave to just about everybody uh, back in my UCB days, and it became a joke. Like Ed Helms, if you're in the scene with, with Ed Helms, you're either going to be named Baxter or Juniper. Like for some reason, those two names, like I would just endow other characters. I'd be like, Juniper, can you pass the milk <laughs> or like whatever? And then, and then of course the person's just named Juniper for the rest of the scene. I don't know why those, but those names became my go-tos. All right. Um, we're supposed to be wrapping up, right? One more question. Uh, yeah, sure. One more. I got to make it a doozy. Yeah, you really uh, do. Find find one from either a Juniper or a Baxter. All right. Uh, do you think philosophers? <laughs> this is good. I mean, it's good, but I don't know if it's an in, if it's end word. I'm going to ask it. Do you think philosophers influence human evolution or are they analyzing what they see? It's kind of, I feel like I kind of asked a similar question earlier. Um, it's like reactive versus proactive or something, right? Yeah. Um, we, which side of, of a decision does moral philosophy really sit on? Are you, are you helping someone make the decision or are you sort of explaining retroactively how a decision was made? I, I'll say this. I was talking about TV uh, as a, as a medium recently. And I think the thing that I, TV is better at than any other medium that we have invented, save possibly music, but I think TV is better than music is that TV has a way of, of pinpointing something in the culture that's floating around that people haven't quite put a name to yet. And sometimes it's accidental and sometimes it's on purpose, but TV just has this ability to kind of pull a vibe out of the country and crystallize it and make it and and people go like oh yes that's that's i i lock into this that's what i'm feeling ted lasso during the pandemic was a good example recently right where people were just alone and scared and sad and then this show came along and it was like you know what we all want to do is like have a big bushy mustache and hug each other and uh, but like uh, different, you know, uh, Breaking Bad tapped into something that was like dark and festering about the human condition at that time. And and uh, there, uh, you could any number of shows, Friends in the 90s, like there are uh, Seinfeld in the sort of ironic age, like it has this way of kind of crystallizing the mood of a country. Philosophy is not, I think, and this is not my area of expertise, but it's not that different because if you look at these big schools of philosophy, they were attempt they were looking around at the world and they were trying to make sense of a kind of ethical theory that fit the world in which they lived so for example aristotle is live writing in in greece in you know 2400 bc era and he's his singular focus is like how can we like this is a grand experiment this city state right this this new we're trying to set an example for the world. So what's important? Well, what's important is civics and ethics and the ways in which people relate to each other and are, are, and are participatory. And so he was like trying to crystallize this vibe that he found in that he was that he was seeing in Athens in terms of like what the people in Athens were wanted or how they could behave. And Jeremy Bentham, the utilitarian was a socialist. And so he was trying to design a sort of ethical theory that was like, hey, what if everybody is the same? Everybody's pain is the same. Everybody's happiness is the same. Let's get rid of this concept of class and elitism and all this stuff and, and just try to equalize the human condition and so that your pain or happiness is no different from mine, no matter who we are. That was a revolutionary idea in England in the, in the 18th century. So I think that it's a little bit of both, which is a boring answer. But I, I, what I really think is that these big picture theories are often coming from philosophers trying to say, this is how I think the world is operating right now. And this is how I think we should move forward from here to, to kind of capitalize on whatever the vibe or mood is of the world in which we live. So I don't know if that answers the question, but I do believe that's true. I, I liked that answer very much, but I'm not going to let you go because I found a great one to end on. Great. So this is the last question. Uh, it is from Rachel. 
I loved how the Good Place podcast always ended with guests answering the question, what's good? With something positive going on in their lives or the world. So my question is, Mike and Ed, what's good? Hmm. Do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? Um, sure, I'll go first. Um, some 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 good things. Uh uh, well, I, I mentioned it already, but we just wrapped season two of Rutherford Falls late last night, and I now have a nice little break of time that I get to spend with my family, and I'm extremely feeling extremely grateful and excited about it. And uh, in a more sort of like, that's a personal answer, a more sort of world aware answer, um, I'm seeing uh I'm seeing s music venues starting to kind of have shows and I, that's something I'm very passionate about. And I, I hope, I, I just sort of hope and trust that it's being, that in many cases it's, I'm sure not all cases, but, but that it's being done in, in safe ways. And I, I guess what I'm saying is that the good thing is that it looks like we're trending towards a, a getting to a place where we can see live music again and that artists can perform mm -hmm. that music, which I know is incredibly enriching for them. And, um, and I, I, I am a great believer in the role of music in our sort of culture and society and, uh, and its importance. And I think that live music fosters not just the experience of seeing that you don't just get the kind of endorphin rush of seeing live music it is also a catalyst for artists to create more and better music uh, in their own processes and so i just think live music is an incredibly special thing and i hope and feel i feel a sense of optimism that we're getting closer to that getting back to something resembling normal okay you that was a, a gosh darn good answer well done <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'll tell you my good thing, which is all I've been thinking about recently for obvious reasons, is I am now on day two of testing negative after having COVID. I got COVID. Uh, I tested positive now, whatever it is, uh, nine days ago, something like that. Sunday, last Sunday. No, it's not even, oh, it's only six days ago. I tested positive on Sunday. I was feeling crappy on Saturday. I tested positive Sunday. I uh, isolated in my home, stayed away from everybody. Um, I had a what amounted to a mild head cold for four days. And then yesterday I tested negative and today I tested negative again. And so what's good? Science. Science is good. A bunch of scientists in a bunch of different places were faced with an unprecedented challenge. And in all record time, invented a thing that I put into my body, caused me zero harm except for a sore arm and a headache. And then I got the deadliest viral contagion the world maybe has ever known. And I had a mild cold for four days. And I felt wave after wave after wave of gratitude for the heroic effort on the part of scientists everywhere and of medical professionals and of all sorts of different people who faced down this thing and with alarming speed and incredible skill um, invented something that could essentially, who knows, save my life, save the life of my wife who just tested positive because I got her sick, um, save the lives of my children, save the lives of countless millions and millions of people all across the world. It really is a, it's a thing I've been thinking about for the better part of 14 months. And now it became very real for me. And I just, I'm blown away. I just, I don't understand the bravery and the heroism of all of the people, not only the people who invented the vaccine and distributed it, but the people who have been taking care of us for the last two years. It's, it's beyond heroic. It's the, it's the, maybe the single greatest collective human feat of kindness and generosity and skill that the world has ever seen. So what's good is science and, and uh, the medical profession in general. Great answer. I liked that one a lot. And I'm glad you're okay, Mike. Thank you, buddy. Um, this has been a tremendous pleasure. I get to talk to you in real life 
very often and I am grateful for that. But it's also kind of fun to have a formal structure. And, I agree. I like taking like the, I like uh, every time we chat, we should invite some audience to pose questions to us. <laughs> <laughs> the Q&A is, uh, it's great. Um, well, thanks to everybody who tuned in. Uh, thanks for having us. And thank you, Mike, for writing a fantastic book. Everyone should get it and read it. Thank you, buddy. How to be perfect in stores now. Thank you to the National Writer Series for having us. This was a lot of fun. And thanks to everyone at home or elsewhere who watched. And we'll see you around. Thank you, Michael and Ed, for that perfect conversation. We hope you enjoyed the show and encourage you to continue the conversation by purchasing a copy of How to Be Perfect from your favorite independent bookstore. I'd also like to extend another heartfelt thanks to all of our sponsors and partners. And to you, our viewers, we are so grateful. Your support makes all the difference. The proceeds from our events go to our Raising Writers programs to help share the love of reading and writing with our regional youth. Thank you and good night.